Um, so welcome everyone. Uh, thank you for joining the World Uga Congress to the second panel of this webinar on the occasion of the 100th anniversary of the Chinese Communist Party. Uh, my name is Kun Stope and I'm the EU Policy Coordinator for the World Uga Congress and I will be moderating this panel. For those of you who attended the first panel, you will have heard from the community leaders there that today is not an occasion to celebrate, but to see it as a reminder of the century of oppression that Uyghurs, Tibetans, Southern Mongolians, Hong Kongers, Taiwanese, as well as Chinese human rights defenders have all experienced under the CCP's brutal regime. China's deteriorating human rights record has also not gone unnoticed by other national governments, as well as the United Nations and the European Union. During this second panel, we will discuss the policy responses to China's human rights abuses at home, as well as its increasing repressive influence abroad. Um, I'm therefore honored to be joined by such a great panel of speakers. Um, so in al alphabetical order, we are first of all joined by Mr. Norman Baker, uh, who has been a member of UK Parliament between 1997 and 2015. He also served as Minister of State at the Home Office in the Coalition Government of 2010-2015. Um, next, we are joined by Mr. Samuel Gogolati, who is a member of the Belgian Parliament, where he has been leading the effort towards recognition of the Uyghur genocide, resulting in a res resolution recognizing a serious risk of genocide just this month. Our third speaker is Mr. Rafa Glucksmann, who is a member of European Parliament within the Socialists and Democrats group, He's been serving as vice chair of the European Parliament Subcommittee on Human Rights, as well as uh, a member of the Committee of Foreign Affairs. Um, we are expected to be joined by uh, Ms. Dovile Sakaliene as well, a member of the Lithuanian Parliament, where she has been leading the initiative that resulted in the adoption of a resolution recognizing the Uyghur genocide. Um, we also have the honor to welcome Mr. Giulio Terzi, who has held various positions as an Italian diplomat. Uh, amongst other positions, he was Italy's Minister of Foreign Affairs from 2011 to 2013, the permanent representative, representative of Italy to the United Nations in New York, as well as an ambassador of Italy to the United States. Uh, we will further hear from Mr. Engin, Engin Aroglu, uh, who is a member of parliament within the Renew Group, uh, who unfortunately could not join us in person today, uh, but he has kindly agree, agreed to share a video message that we will uh, display shortly. Um, and finally, we were supposed to be joined by uh, Ms. Nusrat Ghani, who is a member of the UK parliament, uh, but to unforeseen circumstances, uh, she will not be able to join. Um, and before hearing from our distinguished speakers, I will briefly explain the format of the panel, uh, which is as follows. Um, first, I will give the floor to each speaker who will deliver brief opening remarks. After that, we will move on to a moderated discussion. And finally, there will be some time for the audience to ask questions. So if you have any questions, you can already start writing them in the chat. Um, you can continue doing so throughout this panel. Um, and finally, please make sure to keep your questions concise uh, and also specify who you would like to answer your ask your question to. Um, and before handing it over to our speakers, um, uh, just notice that this webinar will be recorded. Um, so just to take uh, take note of that. Um, on that note, I would like to give the, the floor to uh, to Mr. Baker for uh, for his opening remarks. Uh, Mr. Baker, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, and thank you for inviting me along here today. And I'm very pleased to be able to contribute to this important event. And by the important event, I'm referring to what you're doing rather than the, the ghastly uh, events in Beijing celebrating, if that's their word, 100 years of the Chinese Communist Party. Listening to what Xi Jinping said earlier on today displayed total arrogance and a total contempt for human rights of any sort. He talked about opponents having their heads smashed into steel walls uh, if they disagree with him. He also said that the Chinese uh, government doesn't impose their views on other countries. Try telling that to the Tibetans who've been subject to uh, occupation since 1959. And he also reiterated his determination to take over Taiwan, which has been proudly independent um, long before the Chinese Communist Party took over. They've never ruled Taiwan, of course. If there's a hell on earth, it's within those areas controlled by China and where Muslims and Buddhists live, the Uyghur region and the occupied Tibet, because the Chinese leadership regards anyone who is not Han Chinese as inferior and sees their differences as a threat to the motherland. So the culture of the Uyghurs and the Tibetans, their language, their customs, their religious practices all have to be crushed out of existence. Those who resist, for example, by wanting to pray in a mosque, are classified as terrorists. There's always been dictators and unpleasant regimes in the world. The difference with Xi Jinping and his two-dimensional henchmen is the sheer scale of the brutality and the heightened technical capability to control people that no state has had before. They have many levers of repression and they pull them as fast as they go. The UK Parliament, 
describes what's happening in the Uyghur region as genocide, accurately so. They echo dozens of experts in international law who concluded that the Chinese government is guilty of violations under each and every act of the, of the uh, Genocide Convention. The world cannot stand by and allow genocide to continue while she realizes his dream of eliminating any culture within China's borders occupied otherwise does not hand Chinese and turning people into obedient robots. We can't stand by as norms of international behavior are torn up, as countries are bullied, as a stranglehold exerted on key resources. We cannot stand by as truth is replaced by lies. The democratic world needs to come together to challenge the Xi clique. And we can start by pressing the International Olympic Committee to move the 2022 Winter Games out of China. And if they won't, Western countries should all refuse to send any diplomatic presence. There's a disease which has come out of China in the last few years. I'm not referring to COVID. I'm referring to a cancer that's spreading across the world. The world needs to come together to eliminate this cancer. Thank you so much, Mr. Baker, for, for those opening remarks. Um, secondly, I would like to give the floor um, to um, Mr. Uh, Giulio Terzi uh, for his opening remarks. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Karen. And I'd like to, uh, to address uh, President Balconisa and to express uh, my sincere appreciation to, to President uh, Balconisa and the organizers of this important discussion. A discussion on China's human rights violation, on China's repressive policies at home, and on the nefarious and destabilizing, destabilizing influence of the Chinese Communist Party, censorship and disinformation. And that is not only in China, this nefarious influence, as it properly uh, focused uh, in the title of this uh, discussion, of this session, but it is in every region of the world where the Chinese leadership decides to pursue more and more forcefully and arrogantly by the day, its strategy of political, economic, and even military domination. It is important to have this discussion on this tragic, tragic anniversary of the 100th birthday of the CCP. It is a tragic anniversary for the entire humanity because of the many tens of millions of victims under Mao's rule due to his great leap forward and to the Cultural Revolution. And it is a tragic anniversary because of what is happening in Xinjiang, in Tibet, in Hong Kong, in Taiwan Straits, in the South China Sea, and all over the world where the negative influence exerted by China encourages, helps, and even requests autocratic regimes and dictators to commit massive violations of human rights and violent repressions, such as in Myanmar, Cambodia, Iran, Syria, Venezuela, and so on. Since the very beginning, the CCP has been a history of tragedies. If it is true that among the 12 founding members, 10 were assassinated or disappeared, except of Mao himself and another member who managed to escape abroad, extreme violence, purges, persecution, one-man rule, corruption, and ideological imperialism were there since the beginning they were since the beginning the trademark of the glorious legacy of the CCP that President Xi Jinping and these 80 plus million CCP members are celebrating today very arrogantly as Honorable Norman Baker just said. Large part of today's world and especially the West democracies have reassessed the true nature of communist China, fortunately, over the last couple of years especially, and over the few months in particular, there is a deeper and more generalized understanding about the mistakes made by the West, especially the US and the EU. The biggest mistakes were the opening of WTO to China and to other bilateral and multilateral trade agreements without any serious guarantee and any credible strategy to enforce the obligations and undertaken by China in almost every field of economic, scientific, security relations, and above all in the area of human rights, fundamental freedoms, and rule of law. Over the last 20 years, and even more over the last six years, China's violations of the international law have enormously increased to the point that the horror of genocide are resurfacing once again against the Uyghurs in Xinjiang, 
with strategies and objectives very similar and even I would say identical to those conceived and implemented during the Nazi rule in Europe. Today is therefore an important opportunity to express and demonstrate the closest solidarity to President Dolkunisa and to all the people he is representing. It is also the opportunity to reiterate our firm commitment to fight for a cause which is not only a matter for, of death or life, of freedom of slavery, of dignity or shame for millions of persecuted victims. It is also a matter of survival and success for the mental, fundamental values of European civil society. And is in a good direction that large segments of the international community are moving with the G7 uh, decisions, with the North Atlantic decisions recently, and all this format like the uh, Pacific Quad and other formats which are compacting the response of the international community. Organizations like our organization, like Global Committee for the Rule of Law, uh, to which I'm very proud to uh, uh, see as a member, uh, Honorable Norman Becker, are engaged, but even larger, much larger organizations, all committed. And this is a day by day work that we have to carry on and without being never being discouraged, but very very uh, uh, committed to go for work. Thank you so much, Mr. Terzi. Um, next, I would like to give the floor to uh, Mr. Samuel Kogulati. The uh, floor is yours. Thank you, Kuhn. And uh, thank you so much to uh, the World Uyghur Congress for this invitation. It's really a great honor and, and privilege uh, to sit in this virtual panel with uh, such esteemed and, and, and colleagues uh, like uh, Rafael, it's always a pleasure to see you uh, and, uh, and with distinguished uh, uh, speakers with, with great experience on the field of, uh, of human rights. Um, this is not a day to, to celebrate, it's the title of, uh, of your panel, but I would still like to um, express um, one, one thing um, which I can, which I think we can celebrate, uh, at least uh, in in Belgium, and 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 I hope beyond also in 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 Europe. Uh, Kuhn, it's not a secret. Uh, just a, a few days ago, we celebrated with the Belgian Uyghur community uh, a great achievement, a great vote uh, in Belgium. Just a few days ago, we were able to pass a resolution uh, expressly condemning and recognizing crimes against humanity and also a serious risk of genocide against the Uyghur people. Not only that, but we also called our government, our federal government in Belgium, to take action, to take action against the Chinese Communist Party um, by taking sanctions, um, but also by forbidding and, um, and stopping import from any kind of forced labor uh, in, uh, in, in China, but also to freeze uh, the investment agreement between uh, China uh, and uh, the European Union, and also to terminate the extradition treaty, which was just signed a few years ago, and which just entered into force this year between Belgium uh, and China. This is really um, a significant achievement and um, a vote that was completely unimaginable uh, uh, just a few months ago. Uh, I remember when we first submitted uh, the text of the proposal of this resolution in the parliament in February of this year, um, the press was uh, commenting and saying that it wasn't likely to be adopted. And now I am very proud to say that next week, uh, Thursday on the 8th of July, we will have a very broad majority of democratic parties, except the Communist Party in Belgium, except that one, which will be again abstaining, but all other democratic parties in Belgium will vote in favor of this uh, strong text. And this would not have been possible without, of course, the mobilization, the extraordinary mobilization of the World Uyghur Congress and of all the Uyghur friends who are refugees, political refugees uh, in Belgium, but also of this cross-political party solidarity. Uh, I was saying I was very happy to see Rafael again because he was, he was one of the major helps uh, in making this change possible uh, also uh, in Belgium. And I think that when it comes to justice, when it comes to the defense 
of the basic human rights and values of minorities, of, uh, of the Uyghur people, for example, for instance. Uh, but I'm also thinking of the defense of all those young people marching in the street in Hong Kong for democracy. I'm also thinking of Taiwan or of the, the, the religious freedoms of Tibetans. I believe that Democrats should stand together, uh, whatever the party lines, whatever the country they are from, whatever the community, we should stand together in order to defend human rights. And so again, um, thank you, thank you for, for this invitation and, and always very happy to cooperate uh, with you uh, to defend those basic values. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Kogelati. Um, and just to echo, um, there are indeed still things to celebrate uh, today. As you said, there are great results that we can together all achieve. Uh, and I think also to highlight what was said during the previous panel um, is, is also the solidarity between these communities that are all facing repression in China um, and those communities that are in exile and coming together in so many different countries during protests or other actions. I think that's something that we can celebrate. And I think that's also something that's worth highlighting uh, during this day. Um, and on that note, I would like to give the floor uh, to, our, to our last speaker, uh, Mr. Rafael Buxman. Thank you. Uh, can you hear me? Perfect. So uh, yeah, I agree. We should celebrate uh, human solidarity. But uh, we have also to understand what we are confronted with. And, uh, why we have so much trouble in getting results in terms of uh, fear pressure to be exerted on the Chinese government when we speak about a crime against humanity. And why, why is it so complicated for Western democracies to actually uh, go from words to action? And one of the reasons is philosophical, is that we actually believe in the end of history, and we are very, very, very reluctant to understand that we have a competitive uh, systemic rival. And, and, and not only because it's a huge economic power, but because it offers an alternative model based on the tyranny, oppression, and the suppression of freedoms. But it's a working model, which means that it's a powerful one. And the second reason is that this model has uh, managed to convert huge uh, parts of our uh, business class uh, to its cause. And when we are in the European Parliament and we try to pass resolution or, or text in support uh, of Uyghur, we are not meeting lobbyists of the Chinese government. The people putting pressure on us not to support Uyghurs too much are actually the representative of big European companies because they are involved in the crimes of the Chinese Communist Party. And there is another thing to celebrate today that I can inform you that uh, the French justice just started an uh, official investigation and a case against Zara, uh, Uniqlo, and many other uh, well-known brands, multinationals, for uh, complicity in crimes against humanity because they benefit in their value chain uh, as ex of uh, the work of furniture, Chinese suppliers exploiting uh, Uyghur slaves. So it's, it's a very complicated struggle. And that's why I, I want to call on, on all of us that, uh, and to remind us that it will be a very long and tough fight because inside our own system, we have people actually working for Chinese interests. And this is a huge problem. And that's why I always say that when we are supporting and defending the rights of Uyghurs or Tibetans or just prisoners of conscience in China, we are also defending ourselves. And when we are dealing with the Chinese Communist Party, we are in fact defining who we want to be as Europeans. Do we want to have a destiny and a fate of, uh, I don't know, of uh, people uh, actually serving 
a super power called China and fed by this super power, totally dependent on the Chinese apparat production apparatus system? Or do we want to have autonomous world and to be able to keep our principle and to stand for them? And that's the question we should ask to our government and to all of us personally. How much are we ready to pay to actually stand by our principle? Because there will be a price if we change our policy towards China. And, and this price will be paid by consumers, it will be paid by some companies, and it will be paid by people who are, who are very strong inside our own system. So it's a long-term fight. And what I'm trying to explain to uh, uh, everybody I meet is that you should stand for Uyghur people, not only because you are human beings and that's a crime against humanity should interest the entire humanity, but also because by standing for the rights of Uyghur, actually you are standing for your own rights and, and for your own future. And that's why it's so important for us. And that's why for the last two years, I mean, basically what we have uh, done in our office is just become a kind of Uyghur ambassador inside the European Parliament. But it, 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 it's something that's uh, de defining who we want to be as Europeans and as Democrats and as human beings. So I'm always telling just one last word that, uh, you know, I was raised in, 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 in a society that was constantly asking itself, what would we have done in 1942 had we been alive? And there is no response to this question. Nobody knows. But one question we cannot have response to is what we are doing today against the crime against humanity. And to this question, we should have all of us responses. What do we do for the Uyghur as we speak? So I'm very happy to be here and the fight goes on. Thank you so much, Mr. Mr. Glucksmann, for these uh, for these strong remarks. Um, and for our final opening remarks, um, we have uh, Mr. Engineer Roglu, who has kindly share, uh, shared a video message with us. Um, so I will uh, share my screen and uh, display the, the video. Heute feiert die chinesische Kommunistische Partei 100-jähriges Bestehen. Der Scheinwerfer wird darauf gelenkt, was die großen positiven Errungenschaften der chinesisch-kommunistischen Partei sind. Dabei wird aber nicht der Scheinwerfer darauf gerichtet, welchen Preis viele Menschen in den letzten Jahrzehnten dafür zahlen mussten oder auch noch zahlen werden. Das Regime inszeniert sich. In Hongkong und in Tibet werden Menschenrechte mit Füßen gedroht. Und die chinesische Partei wird immer mehr zur Bedrohung der Menschenrechte in China. In der Region Xinjiang wird, werden Menschenrechte mit Füßen getreten. Viele Millionen Uiguren sind in Zwangsarbeiterlagern und es wird ein Genozid an den Uiguren verübt. Viel zu lange blieb die Kritik an diesen Verbrechen unter einem Deckmantel des Schweigens verborgen. Gemeinsam können wir dort aber eine Kehrtwende einführen. Gemeinsam ist es uns möglich, endlich diese Verbrechen auf den Tableau der Politik zu schieben. Ich bin sehr dankbar, dass in, den letzten, äh, in der letzten Zeit viele Kollegen aus nationalen Parlamenten, aber auch aus dem Europäischen Parlament gemeinsam die Situation in China nicht hinnehmen möchten. Wir haben es geschafft, hier gemeinsam im Europäischen Parlament das Kai-Abkommen mit China ähm, zu beerdigen oder zu stoppen und aber auch Sanktionen zu verabschieden, zu verabschieden gegen die handelnden Personen dieser Verbrechen. Es spielt aber noch viel mehr Handlungsbedarf, wenn wir uns den Genozid an den Uiguren anschauen. Es bedarf ganz kurzfristig und ganz konkret ein, Investi ein, 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 ein Stopp von Produkten aus Zwangsarbeit. Zusätzlich müssen wir den Menschen, die in China verfolgt werden, Journalisten die Möglichkeit geben, die Angst in China haben um ihr Leben durch ihre Arbeit, die Möglichkeit geben, in der Europäischen Union Zuflucht über eine Rettungsbootpolitik zu führen. Gleichzeitig müssen wir zusehen, dass wir Menschen, die aufgrund der Arbeit an Menschenrechten in China verfolgt werden, die schon in der Europäischen Union sind, nicht wieder abgeschoben werden in dieses Regime. 
Da müssen wir gemeinsam dran arbeiten. Die chinesische Regierung zeigt uns durch, ihre, durch ihre, ihr Verhalten aufgrund dieser Diskussion ganz klar auf, wo sie stehen. Sie reagieren aggressiv. Die chinesische Regierung kommt rüber mit Sanktionen, mit, mit Falschinformationen, aber auch mit Einschüchterungsversuchen gegen europäische und nationale Politiker. Wir dürfen dem Regime in China nicht klein beigeben. Wir müssen ganz klar zeigen, dass wir als Koalition der Werte, der Stärke, der Leidenschaft der Menschenrechte uns hier nicht einschüchtern lassen. Heute gibt es was zu feiern und das ist unsere gemeinsame Stärke. Und genau diese lassen Sie uns gemeinsam ausbauen und in der Zukunft weiter für Menschenrechte und Freiheit einzustehen. Vielen Dank. Um, I see that by now we've also uh, been joined by uh, Ms. Sakalene. Um, can, you, can you hear us? Yes, yes, I can. Yes, I Wonderful, can. thank you so much. Um, then I will directly give the floor to you to, as our last speaker for the, for the opening remarks. Uh, okay, thank you. Uh, obviously, the summer heat in Lithuania, which is probably now became in the tropical zone, is affecting me because I thought that it's going to start half an hour later. So I'm very, very sorry for being late. But um, actually, uh, my, to be short, I think that the main idea is to understand that all communist regimes are used to authoritarian methods, are used to threatening people, imprisoning them, uh, hurting them physically and mentally. However, when I compare with what we as Lithuania have experienced uh, in the Soviet communist time, I still see some uh, very worrying differences. I see that uh, China communist regime definitely sees no boundaries, no humanity probably left there at all among their high uh, political communist officials. That's why I believe it's uh, probably not enough for people in China to rebel against this uh, uh, undemocratic actions, not enough for people there, for Uyghur uh, minority living in China It's not enough if we don't step in. Um, that's why I believe that only if we continue our unified efforts through everything that we can do uh, within the democratic mandate that we have, within international law standards that are set, resolutions, uh, calls for action, calls for political boycott, for example, when we're talking about uh, uh, Beijing Olympic Games, uh, et cetera, et cetera. I believe that only international pressure can help break this um, iron fist rule, as uh, I, I don't really know how to call it more diplomatically. And I'm really happy that uh, just today, um, our president, president of Lithuania, Mr. Nauseda, uh, sent a letter uh, uh, to the um, European uh, uh, Leaders uh, uh, Council stating very clearly that we as European Union must have unified solid position. There can be no more 17 plus one uh, formats. There can be no more any, any divisive uh, uh, voices that you know some, some states seem rather keen to choose uh, short term economic benefits over protection of democracy and human rights even though what we see now isn't even a benefit after all. So unified position, not stopping international pressure and understanding that communist regimes will always be cruel. And only us pressuring from outside can help these people. We cannot say that you know, they have to move uh, from grassroots. It's not, it's not, I don't even know how to express this. I'm, I'm sorry. <laughs> My, Uh, Lithuanian English translator probably is not working very well today, but um, what I remember as a very, very uh, sad moment from uh, my parents and my grandparents' memories when we were under Soviet occupation was that we felt left alone a lot of time. We felt that our fight for freedom and for democracy, our fight to get free from communist regime is only our own. And only we, when we started to get more and more support, more and more people felt empowered, able to stand up for democracy, able to stand up for freeing from the communist regime. Now, I hope I made myself clear because I'm, 
I admit I'm horribly stressed that I mixed up the time and I was so late. So. No worries at all. Um, we're very happy to, to, to still have you here. Um, and at least from my part, your opening remarks were, uh, were perfectly clear. Uh, so thank you so much for, uh, for those. Um, having heard now from, from all speakers in their, in their opening remarks, uh, we will now turn to uh, an open discussion between, between the speakers. Um, so first of all, for all participants, uh, the, the chat remains open for any questions that you might have uh, to the speakers, uh, which we will hopefully have time for uh, at the end of this panel. Um, as, I, as I mentioned in the beginning, please uh, make sure to be concise um, and please uh, direct your uh, question to, to one of the speakers. Um, then I will now open the floor. Uh, I will ask the question to, to one of our speakers, but for the other speakers, please feel free to, to, uh, to add to anything that you uh, might have to say um, as to make it as uh, inclusive as possible. Um, so today we've talked about a lot about uh, looking back um, during the first panel, we've heard a lot about the, the experiences that many of these communities share. Um, looking at this from a more policy angle or more from the angle of the international community, I would like to ask to uh, Mr. Terzi, um, during your long and distinguished diplomatic career, um, how have you experienced uh, how Italy's approach to China and its human rights record uh, has evolved? Thank you. Thank you very much for the question. I, I have to say that I was very much disappointed until uh, the uh, government of uh, Mario Draghi started his uh, mandate. I was very much disappointed uh, with the previous uh, two mandates of uh, Giuseppe Conti, especially about uh, the foreign policy direction he was taken under the pressure of the Five Star Movement uh, passion to approach China across the board, not only for economic purposes and to increase the economic relations, but also looking at the security issues and buying most of the time all the positions and the theories that were proposed by the Chinese Communist Party. So now uh, the Italian position is uh, on, on safer ground, I believe, with uh, President Draghi is uh, very much an Atlanticist and an and, and European uh, believer. So uh, I was mentioning the G7 declaration, the Atlantic um, uh, communique and so on and so on, uh, bilateral meetings also with uh, different counterparts. And, and I think now we are on the safe ground still. There are some uh, elements, some evidences that uh, the, the huge lobby uh, and the huge capacity of influencing that the Chinese government has on the Italian environment, the political one especially, but also the media environment, the economic environment, uh, put us under a constant pressure and we have to keep our eyes very much open. I want to just to ask the other panelists. Uh, I, I heard there was a, a slight reference to the extradition treaties, uh, which are in, in force uh, between uh, European countries and uh, China. This is a very critical point. I think that we should concentrate. I mean, in our uh, uh, think tanks and so on, but also to try, especially in the European Parliament, this question of the enforcement of the national security law by China and to use the extradition treaties in, in a perspective which is very uh, possibly also uh, tomorrow uh, uh, to, uh, to damage uh, the position of poli political refugees, Uyghurs, but also others in Europe is a, is a very important question. And they wonder, and this, the question is to the honorable member of the European Parliament, whether this issue has been properly uh, uh, addressed and uh, if it is a true matter of concern in Brussels. Thank you. So shall I directly respond, I guess? Please go ahead. Yeah, I think you are fully right. It's, it's a huge concern and, and it's not uh, addressed yet in the way it should be. And beyond the extradition treaties, we have a, uh, uh, the behavior of uh, of uh, Chinese uh, embassies and Chinese agents in Europe threatening uh, Uyghur refugees, uh, uh, political opponents, dissidents, uh, Tibetans, Hong Kongese uh, on our soil. And I'm sharing in the European Parliament 
uh, a special committee on uh, foreign interference and uh, and we will issue a very uh, tough report on Chinese behavior in Europe this threat obviously and we will have a, 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 a point on the extradition uh, treaties but we will also address this threat violence and uh, another issue, and that's why you mentioned Italy, and I think that there has been a, a very good positive change with Mr. Draghi coming to office, not only on diplomatic uh, issues, but also on the screening of investment and, and, and uh, the affirmation of, of European sovereignty and uh, national security concerns. Because uh, for a long period, there have been a huge naivety in some European countries and here in Brussels, but what it means to have Chinese uh, big companies investing in our uh, strategic infrastructure. And um, look at the debate on 5G and, uh, and the fact that, uh, well, 90% of the German establishment was perfectly happy with the idea that Huawei could, uh, con could actually control our technological infrastructure. And this, this naivety has to stop because as you mentioned, the national security law in China makes it very clear. These big companies are not independent of the Chinese Communist Party and that they are part of the regime. And when we speak with Huawei, then we can perfectly understand that it's part of the repressive regime uh, that's actually committing a crime against humanity uh, against the Uyghur. And, uh, and, and we have to stop this safety in general. And I think that there is a shift in the, in the mindset in Europe now, and it's very positive. But we are not there yet, not at all. Um, and when we when we speak about this shift, it still stops uh, uh, before uh, the measures that could make us uh, serious in the eyes of the Chinese regime. You know, I, I'm trying to explain to my European colleagues that we are not confronted with a, a terrorist network when we speak about the Chinese government. I mean, these people don't think that if they blow themselves up in, in, in a cafe or in a concert hall, they will go to paradise. They are very rational leaders, Chinese leaders as, as they are now. And they make calculations, cost and benefit. And until now, we did not manage to impose a sufficient cost for the, them and to their interests for them to restart, refresh their calculation when it comes, for instance, to uh, deporting the Uyghur nation and enslaving the Uyghurs. So what we have to do is to take measures that inflict a sufficient cost in order to be taken seriously. And right now what we are discussing in the European Parliament, and I think that the only way uh, we can uh, actually achieve this goal, it's a ban on the product of slavery uh, from entering to our market, so import ban on the Chinese suppliers exploiting Uyghur slaves. If we do that, and we did not do that yet, if we do that, and it's a discussion here, then we will be taken seriously, and then we will have an impact. And and that's something that you know. I mean, I think you know perfectly well that uh, Europeans still are reluctant to have an impact sometimes. And uh, and if we are serious about the crime against humanity, then you won't. Be want to have an impact and if we do that then then we are serious actors and then we can have an impact on the situation of what we work on the ground thank you so much mr mr glucksman for uh, for your answer to that um i think both both mr terzi and mr glucksman really described a shift in, in thinking uh, thinking about china uh, mr terzi specifically mentioned his disappointment over uh, in the way china has approached by successive italian governments um, my question also would also be to, to Mr. Baker, um, do you share the sentiment? Uh, do you feel that the United Kingdom has also changed its approach to China um, during your career um, as an MP, for instance? Yes, the, 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 the government, um, both the Labour government and the Conservative government took the view, increasingly so after 2011, uh, that they had to become best friends with China and that the way to influence China was to engage with them. Uh, I think that was folly. I'm a liberal, and I don't want to sound like a hawk, but you know, dealing with the Chinese government is not dealing even with the, uh, with Putin. It's it's much worse. The Chinese government is far less willing to negotiate in a sensible diplomatic way. 
uh, they, 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 they don't give and take, they just take. And they need a different response to that. So any sign of weakness, this is how they see it, any negotiation of a normal sort, they regard as weakness. And we've got ourselves a position in, in, uh, in Britain where we had, in my view, far too much Chinese influence in key areas, in security, uh, through the 5G network, uh, through our nuclear power stations and so on. This is, this is, this is folly to do this. Now that's been to some degree reversed, but the lesson I'm afraid that we have, and I think it's coming back to Mr. Glucksman earlier on, who said there's a price to pay uh, from standing up to China. Yes, there is a price to pay, but we have to pay that price because the alternative is worse. The alternative is that the Chinese mentality, if you like, the Chinese government mentality expands across the world uh, so that making uh, torture, uh, lying, uh, the abuse of human rights generally, the uh, uh, bullying behavior, these will become the international norms. We can't stand by and let that happen. So all the Western countries, and I include not just Western countries, but other countries in the world, South Africa and places, need to come together uh, to say no more. And the way we have to do this is, is to meet fire with fire. I'm not suggesting we have military action, for heaven's sake, but I am suggesting, as uh, Mr. Glucksman said, that we deal with uh, a ban on products uh, from uh, which have been uh, produced from slavery, and a great many of them have, uh, by the Uyghur community themselves, that we have sanctions against individual members of the Chinese government who can be identified as being responsible for appalling acts, uh, that funds in London, in the city, and elsewhere in, are seized from these people. Uh, they're not allowed to benefit from their exploitation of uh, Uyghurs or Tibetans or anything else. And frankly, if I had my way, I had a Xi Jinping up before the International Criminal Court uh, on trial, because that's what he deserves, frankly. So, I, you know, I, I'm person, uh, and the British people, by and large, our mentality is to be gentle and engage and try to be rational. That's our natural position. But it doesn't work with this present Chinese government. They see it as weakness. So we have to come together and be very, very firm. The British government's tried engaging with them. The world tried to engage, as a matter of fact, as well. Do you remember back when the Olympics in 2008, was it 2008, when the idea was if we give the Chinese government the Olympics, uh, they'll be exposed to Western civilization. Um, they'll have the Western journalists there um, and the, the economic benefits automatically will flow into democratic benefits. Well, the Chinese government has proved us wrong. They managed to have economic strength, economic gains, and they've gone backwards in terms of human rights. So that engagement and that in that old fashioned sense simply doesn't work. We have to do something else much firmer. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Baker. Uh, I see Mr. Glucksman has his uh, hand raised. Yeah, because two, two very important things were just said and I want to underline, underline them. First, obviously uh, any political decision is about paying a price. And, and now we have to make the calculation which price are we ready to, to pay? And what would be the price of not paying anything now? I mean, clearly, the price for not standing by our principles will be much higher than any price we will have to pay uh, for standing by our principles. So I fully agree. And the second thing I fully agree is that actually what we are witnessing now is a total denial of everything that was taught to us for the last 30 years. We were taught that if you develop trade, then you will uh, promote human rights. If you open up to uh, trade, then you will actually become slowly a democracy because you will enrich yourselves, you will open up yourselves, and then uh, automatically there will be a progress in terms of human rights. China has become richer, and Chinese uh, uh, middle class has, uh, has risen, but there is a backsliding on every political level in terms of human rights and rule of law. So everything I've learned in my studies uh, when I was in Sciences Po in Paris has been totally denied and invalidated by the Chinese uh, current situation. And that's something that the European elite should be looking at, taking very seriously, not because you trade with people that they suddenly become uh, like you, the liberal democrats. Actually, you can have a country that's open to trade and stay close to human rights. 
Thank you for that, uh, Mr. Glucksmann. Um, we've heard from our speakers so far that it's it's important that governments take appropriate action to, to address the, the human rights abuses in China. Um, however, what we've seen over the past months, I think, has really been uh, a lot of activity on the, part, on the part of national parliaments, first and foremost, to address what is happening. Uh, and from their side, urge the government to take action. Uh, for instance, over the past months, uh, national parliaments have been increasingly outspoken on the Uyghur genocide. Uh, we've, uh, we by now have six resolutions passed in national parliaments. Um, Mr. Gulati, to you, um, what is the significance of such parliamentary action? Well, I would say that parliamentary action at the national level was clearly uh, significant and really made a dramatic change in our policy approach towards China. Just to give you very two very concrete examples uh, from our experience of the last years in Belgium, in my own country. Um, just five years ago, um, Charles Michel, who was um, at the time prime minister of the, the country, signed an extradition agreement to China in exchange for two pandas uh, given to uh, one of the biggest zoos uh, in the south of Belgium. Um, this could sound as a joke, um, but it is not a joke. Um, as an extradition agreement was signed with um, China, um, where you can, of course, imagine that the obligation of due process, the absence of death penalty, um, all those human rights obligations are not at all respected. And so, again, I think this extradition treaty uh, really has no place um, in a country like ours um, at the core of, of Europe. The second example is the implementation of Alibaba, uh, you know, the big e-commerce uh, company, the big rival of Amazon in China, uh, in Belgium, uh, to develop one of the biggest hubs in the world uh, at Liège uh, Airport. The, there was literally a red carpet and all politicians were present uh, just a few years ago to receive Alibaba as a fantastic and marvelous uh, investment, as if, you know, uh, it were kind of um, something great without um, any kind of critical question permitted. Uh, and now we are just slightly realizing that this investment is not without problems. Just a few weeks ago, I uh, submitted questions to the Minister of Justice requesting more information about the kind of risk for the security, for example. And he answered very transparently to my question, saying that, yes, there was a risk, for example, of having Chinese spies deployed within the airport just through this investment of Alibaba. And this is, again, not a huge surprise for us because we know that the Chinese legislation also applies to uh, Chinese companies abroad, uh, including in, in Europe. But again, this is to show that parliamentary action is really necessary in order to reinforce our core human rights values and to pay way more attention to our basic freedoms. I think that European freedoms shouldn't be sacrificed uh, just in order, you know, to develop more commercial and investment exchanges with uh, with a country like China. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Puglati. Um, before I move on to the next question, um, anybody who uh, is listening at the moment who would like to uh, pose a question to any of the speakers, uh, please put your question in the chat. We still have uh, around 10 minutes left. Uh, so if you have any question, please feel free to uh, put it in the chat. Um, thank you again, Mr. Koglati, for that answer on the significance of, of parliamentary action. Um, at the same time, none of the governments, the respective governments, have adopted their parliament's uh, opinion. Um, I would like to ask uh, Ms. Sakliene, um, does this present an insurmountable uh, obstacle to, to actual action to be taken? Uh, and how could governments be swayed to eventually uh, follow their parliaments and, and recognize the Uyghur genocide? Well, it's a difficult question, I admit, and uh, sometimes it seems that uh, um, having uh, a very clear position is uh, a challenge, uh, especially for small countries, especially for uh, countries that uh, have suffered from uh, communist regimes, because some of us have learned our lessons and some probably have not learned enough. 
Uh, and for example, uh, if we are talking about Lithuania, uh, we are a parliamentary republic with uh, 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 some traits of presidential republic, but well, we are parliamentary republic. So when our parliament passed the resolution uh, uh, acknowledging the Uyghur genocide, that was the message from our state. At the same time, our government reacted uh, by dismantling the 17 plus one format. And you know al already how mad the China Communist Party was about that. And they called us uh, uh, servants of the United States and et cetera, et cetera. However, I think what is really important in this is to see the complexity of this issue and apply all, all means necessary at the same time. So I'm a little bit uh, I'm less stressed now for being so late. So I just wanted you know, to, to, to enlist all the things that we are trying to do and what I think that we all as a team of countries, uh, democratic countries should uh, focus our attention to. So of course, foremost, and I've been also repeating that probably like you know, a, a radio show all the time that initiating a investigation under the convention of genocide is necessary it's it's just it's imminent we cannot go on just raising concerns without actually having an investigation into that but also looking geopolitically and strategically we as as my colleague said before we need to understand the price that we have to pay so diminishing dependence on china diversifying our supply chains production chains is also what is important laying the groundwork for us being able to fight also containing expansion of Chinese technologies into our markets. For example, Lithuania has already passed legislation preventing Huawei from entering our market because we officially said that they are dangerous because the Communist Party enables them to spy on all democratic countries. Also sticking together, like my colleague said, no divisive formats, also providing asylum to Uyghur, Hong Kong, Tibetan people who are flying, fleeing the regime who really need our support also expanding sanctions, targeted and specific sanctions. And I agree completely with ban on forced labor products, but also I feel that we need much wider list of high communist officials that are illicit in crimes against humanity in Laogai camps, sterilization, uh, um, organ harvesting programs and etc. And the two uh, uh, more points, what is I think important is also strengthening geopolitical counterweights to China in the region, starting from India and with other states, because we really need to make teams there and also investing in cybersecurity and recognition of the hybrid warfare. We have to admit that it's expanding, it's getting more and more sophisticated, we're not protected from it enough and also educating our businesses. I still have discussion with some people from businesses who say that maybe this interferes with our interests. And I'm saying openly, what does interfere with your interest is that national security law, which now allows Chinese government to nationalize your company if they don't like what you are doing. So you are basically doing business with a snake. You are a mouse in the snake's mouth. So thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Ms. Sakalina. Um, you did mention, um, for instance, the UN Genocide Convention, um, which as a, as a UN mechanism should uh, indeed work to prevent these, these atrocities from happening. Um, my question to, to Mr. Terzi would be, uh, given your experience uh, navigating the UN, uh, UN uh, mechanisms, um, what do you feel that the, the, um, um, the, the role of the United Nations should be? Um, and to what extent has this been uh, successfully done? Um, and what more is, is needed, in your opinion, from the United Nations to address uh, China's human rights abuses? I believe, I believe it is extremely important to continue uh, the uh, action, not necessarily for the time being uh, in the General Assembly and the Security Council, because we know very well that there is a, a, still a lot of work to do in order to pass the idea that the United Nations has to come forward very strongly on the issue of genocide, because there is, it's very evident. I mean, the report written uh, a couple of months, a few months ago by uh, Dr. Zen and others is, is very specific, it is, is impressive. The evidence is there, the legal consideration are there. There is no doubt that uh, a process of genocide is in place there. But to make it um, uh, politically uh, palatable in the United Nations, especially in, in the United Nations General Assembly, 
I believe that uh, uh, it, it should be with the next session of General Assembly. It is an opportunity to start a, 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 a strong, uh, a, a coherent action by a, a group, maybe not necessarily extremely big, of like-minded countries. For instance, the countries which have been able to pass in their parliament, as the Belgian one, but other uh, six or seven parliaments we know, and countries which have uh, recently, at the Council of Human Rights, uh, undersigned, there were 46 or 47 countries which have undersigned the Canadian led uh, uh, declaration concerning the need to have an independent investigation and to proceed with uh, denouncing uh, what is happening in, in Xinjiang. So I believe there is a lot of uh, dynamism that we should inject in the works of the uh, General uh, Assembly since uh, starting with, a, uh, with, a, with, with September, next September is tomorrow. But I, I, I know that it's going to be a difficult process but uh, uh, with the, the consideration that we are having, that now, finally, over the last few months, there is a much stronger coherence and uh, firmer background for a number of countries, at least uh, uh, the uh, Western uh, uh, democracies, but not only, uh, to, to move ahead in the General Assembly without being too much intimidated by Chinese maneuvers. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Telsi. And I think this, this already um, gives an answer to, to two of the questions we already received in, in the chat. Um, and I think this is, I think, the final question that I would like to pose today as, as we're running out of time. Um, so to capture these two questions in, into one, uh, my questions to, to all of the speakers, uh, anybody who would like to answer this, um, how do we indeed effectively uh, come together as an international community uh, first of all, to counter China's influence, its repressive influence in institutions such as the United Nations or other international institutions, but at the same time, also China's influence in, in member states themselves, uh, for instance, through Confucius Institutes that was that was mentioned in the chat, um, or other types such as disinformation or, or propaganda. If I just can have a short answer, China controls uh, about six or seven of the 14 major agencies and programs of the United Nations. This is completely out of line with the kind of contribution, even financial contribution of China to the United Nations. Western countries must coalesce and find this is a major policy point, foreign policy point for all Western democracies. They have to get together and to uh, retake ground that they have lost. But in order to do so, there are also a couple of things which are extremely important. In WTO, the United States must become a proactive force and together with the European Union to move ahead in obtaining uh, improvement in how the WTO works. And the second point, the World Health Organization. This is another dramatically uh, uh, negative example of Chinese influence. Uh, the, that organization, that agency is uh, practically colonized by, by the Chinese government, and it has to be reformed. It has to be, uh, and the, the international agreement, the international health regulation must become enforceable. And that since it is connected to the World Health Organization, now there is a momentum, which is the right one to move ahead in a, a, a steep reform of, of the World Health Organization. Thank you, Mr. Terzi. Uh, Mr. Revlati, Ms. Saklina, do you have anything to add to that? Um, so, well, I believe that if we really want to uh, make a difference when we are talking about these big uh, global uh, formats, international formats, and especially of this uh, huge machine of United Nations, then we uh, first have to break down, uh, the, well, figuratively speaking, the chains that are holding many countries together. So, uh, as I mentioned earlier, uh, investing in uh, strengthening the counterparts of China in the region uh, and making them feel that they are wanted, that their opinion is important to us, expanding the Western club. Next, uh, what is also important is uh, for more and more countries to diminish their dependence on China. When we look at the uh, index of dependency on China in many areas, uh, from technology to supplies of uh, sometimes really trivial things, uh, this index is uh, scary, it's concerning. So we really have to diversify and we really have to expand 
our ability to lean on each other, on uh, democratic countries. And third, um, of course, sticking together. Because if uh, we are just fragmented voices, it's not enough. If we are bigger and bigger club, then we can overpower it. And let's be open. There will be dictatorships. Probably it will take many years and several generations while we get rid of them. But if we uh, expand the club and admit people there and countries there that are willing to talk, even though they are still having a lot of problems, well, when we're talking about India, uh, they do have also, well, horrible number of human rights violations, but they are very different from China. We all see that, you know, we're making a much bigger effort and we have to choose our allies as well. Probably as a member of National Security Committee, I'm becoming somewhat pragmatic but I feel that if we want to win certain fights, we have to make a bigger team. Kun, if I may, um, just uh, a, maybe a last word of, uh, of conclusion. Um, I think we're very lucky in our Western democracies and, and we should feel this privilege and realize that we have a privilege to be elected at the national level or at the European level. Um, in order to defend human rights and basic freedoms. And so I consider it as our responsibility to make the voices of the Uyghur people, of the Tibetan people, of the youth marching in the street in Hong Kong in favor of democracy, to make all these voices heard in Europe, but also all, world, all around the world. Um, we should make clear that human rights are universal uh, principles and do not stop at the borders of our national democracies or of the European Union. And as Julia Tercy said, human rights are really fundamental principles, not only for Western democracies, but also for the whole project of the United Nations. And again, I think we should be uh, proud about that project um, and make our voices heard also at the international level. Uh, that is crucial, uh, that is important, and I believe that indeed, if we stand together, um, no matter uh, the country we are from um, or which political party we are from, if we stand firmly together, then I, I, I believe we can win uh, the, the, this fight uh, for democracy, not so much against China, but more in favor of the respect and the promotion of human rights. Thank you so much for, for that, Mr. Proglazzi. I couldn't have said it any better um, as, as closing remarks. Um, so, so on that note, I would like to, to end this panel here. Um, I would like to thank all of our speakers, uh, not only for, for speaking today and for their wonderful remarks, but for, for everything they're doing also behind closed doors uh, to promote rights of, of Uyghurs and others in China, uh, and indeed to, 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 to stand up for, uh, for a free and, and democratic world. Um, also, thanks to all uh, people who have listened in today. Um, we hope to welcome you again uh, during one of our next uh, next events. Um, so I wish you all a wonderful day ahead. Thank you so much. <laughs>